Hi, thank you for streaming one of our latest messages here at Mountain Lake Church. We hope you enjoyed the message. Please come back again very, very soon. We know that life change stories happen. They happen every day. And at Mountain Lake Church, we want to hear about your life change story. If you'd like to share your story, please visit us at mountainlake.tv and click on the story button. You can also find service locations as well as times. And if you can't come to see us in person, please know that we stream our services every Sunday at 9, 1030 and noon. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. Second part of Romans chapter 13, verse 7, Paul writes this. He says, and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Give respect and honor to those who are in authority. This weekend is first responders weekend, and today we want to give much respect and much honor to our first responders, firefighters, police officers, uh, EMS, 911 dispatch, those people that run into the burning building, those people that run into the hostile situation, those people that are there, that are on the first, that are there first scene that serve our communities in our neighborhoods, in our city, in our county. Today, we give them much honor and much respect. And growing up, I was always taught that, give them much honor and much respect. And I've had great honor and great respect for our first responders. But this past week, I have a greater honor and a greater respect of what they do physically. Physically speaking, what these men and women do uh, every single week to respond to those in crisis, uh, I had an experience, myself and, and Todd and Sean and Brian, who lead worship and preach out at our Dawson campus, we got to experience, just for a brief moment, what our first responders uh, experience every single week on a physical basis. Dennis Vallone, who's a captain of the Alpharetta Police Department, goes here a long time, Mountain Laker. I called him, I said, hey, we want to go, we want to experience, uh, you know, what you guys do on, on a daily basis. And there was a long pause, and then laughter afterwards followed that. And he goes, are you, you serious? I was like, yeah, he was like, you're a preacher. I was like, yeah, I know, I know, it'll be, it'll be good. He's like, okay, well, this is going to be great. And we hang up, and he doesn't really tell us what he has planned for us. And I call him, I go, hey, what are we supposed to wear? He goes, Man, something comfortable like shorts, T-shirt, and sneakers. He goes, it's, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll have a good time. So we show up, myself and, and Todd and, and Sean Wall and, and Brian Oss, we show up there. And he's got some, some competitions, some things, some physical exercises that they go through. And, and of course, being, being four guys, we had to have a, a competition like gamesmanship, sportsmanship. And, and then, of course, we had to make it interesting so we would compete against one another and and we decided that the loser of this competition had to take a, a bite by a canine dog from the canine unit. And so that was what was on the line of, of this, this competition. And so without further ado, here is what we did earlier this week. Let's do it. Hey everybody, it's First Responders Weekend here at Mountain Lake Church. I'm with Todd, I'm with Brian, I'm with Sean. We came out here, we're hanging out with Alpharetta Police, Alpharetta Fire Department. And we just want to see uh, what they do on their, on their daily basis. And so we're going to have some fun. They've got some fun things set up. So here we go. It's going to be the preachers, the worship leaders, the artists versus the theologians. Oh, I'm gonna do it at 110.20. 
Dude, that's no joke. The theologian. One minute. No joke. Eleven twenty-four. <laughs> Well, that's a wrap. We have learned that we sing and we preach way better than we do what these guys do on a daily basis. That's it. We're going to continue to work in church work. That's and we're going to continue <laughs> to sing and to preach. God bless you again. Thank you to all you first responders out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Woo! Yeah. Police department, fire department. You don't have these hazards when you preach. One second. I'm not bitter, but I'm going to blame Brian Haas for our team lose. I'm just going to say that. I mean, you saw him. That was Brian who, who missed it. So anyway, uh, the dog bite was, it was, a, it was an interesting experience. So we had a, had a great time. We came back with so much honor and so much respect. Yes, what, the, what they do day in and day out, but really physically uh, and what they go through. And so I'm just going to ask, um, if you're here in this room and you are a, a first responder, if you would, right where you're at, would you stand up so all of us can thank you and honor you? All first responders in this room, would you stand up? One here, one here, there, back there. Keep standing, remain standing. Remain standing up there, right there. Thank you. Remain standing. And there's a net, remain standing if you're a first responder. There's another group that I'm going to ask uh, to stand next to you. And uh, when we visited uh, with uh, firefighters and police officers, talking with them, they all said, you know, thank you so much uh, for the honor and gratitude. Uh, but they said the, the people that really want, they want us to thank and show honor and gratitude uh, is to their families. Because they said, we signed up for this, our families didn't. And so moms and dads and husbands and wives and sons and daughters, uh, when, they, uh, when they kiss mom or dad or husband or wife goodbye in the morning, uh, they said that's possibly the last time that they will kiss them goodbye. And so um, if you are a family member here in this room of a first re responder, whether they're in this room or, or maybe they're on duty and working this weekend, uh, but if you're a family member of a first responder, would you stand up as well so we can thank you and honor you for the sacrifice that you give every single week? You guys. Right there. You can, you can be seated. There's a truth that I've known uh, and that you've known for a while, but it's a truth that I think we need to be reminded of uh, this week and specifically today. The truth is this, is that first responders, they see and deal with the unthinkable so we don't have to. They see and deal with the unthinkable so we don't have to. Because of first responders, you and I, we can watch the 11 o'clock news at night. We can see the car wrecks or the bad things happen and go, oof, man, that's bad. Turn the television off, roll over, and go to bed. Because there is a first responder out there who sees it and deals with it night in and night out. And talking with these first responders, they, they see with it, and they, yes, they deal with it in the moment. They run into the burning building, and they're the first ones on the scene of a car wreck. They, the first ones in a hostile situation with bad guys. They're the first ones there. They deal with it there in the moment, but they also deal with it in the days, weeks, months, and sometimes even years to follow. They deal with it there in the moment, but then they have those memories, those images burned into their minds. They have to go run into a burning building and fight that fire, and then they go to a Little League game. They're the first ones on the scene of a really awful accident, car accident. They handle the situation, and then they go to a dance recital. 
They're the first ones on the scene of a hostile situation and dealing with and neutralizing bad guys and then go home for family dinner. They see and deal with it and then go home to their husbands or wives, sons or daughters, moms or dads. And so, yes, they see and deal with it there in the moment. They deal with it in the days, weeks, months, and sometimes years following. And I was talking with one of the SWAT officers that we visited with on Monday and just was talking to him. And I said, I said, how do you deal with it? I said, I know you, you're physically trained and I know you've, you're, you're trained to handle the situation, neutralize it, and then, but that's over. But how do you deal with it? And he just says, you learn to compartmentalize things. And he said, you just learn to shut that part of your brain off and be there with your spouse or with your kids. And I said, yeah, but I said, but there, there's got to be things in your mind that, that you don't forget. And he got real quiet. And he nodded and he said, yeah. And he says, just as we're talking, he goes, I can think of two situations that will forever be burned into my mind. And so, yes, they deal with it there in the moment, but they deal with it in the days, weeks, months, and years following. And so if you're a first responder here in this room and, and you may never step, step foot in this church again, you may never remember my name, but I want you to walk away today with just a simple prayer that you can pray the next time you find yourself in one of those tense, ugly situations, those unthinkable situations, those moments where you're trying to deal with it there, but then in the days, weeks, months, and years following, I just want to give you a prayer that you can pray today. And ultimately, this prayer, it's for all of us. Because no, we may not be walking into combative situations on a daily or weekly basis, but we walk into situations that are mentally or emotionally or most certainly spiritually taxing on our lives. You walk into conversations, situations, boardroom meetings. If you're a student, you're walking into a locker room or a school room. If you're a mom or a dad, you're dealing with situations. There are moments where we walk into spiritual battle. And for all of us, this prayer is really something that we can pray before we walk into those situations, into those moments. Because as a pastor, I care deeply about your spiritual life. And I want you to guard and protect the spiritual things going on in your life. It is a real battle on the inside of your heart and your mind and your soul. A spiritual battle that is at war. Today, I just want to give you a simple prayer that you can pray to begin to protect and guard your spiritual life. Because you know this, and I know this, that we, we guard and we protect things that are valuable to us. Things that are of high value and high worth, we guard and we protect. Your very expensive cell phone, my guess is you put it in some type of case or some type of screen protector. That way you can drop it or throw it in water. Or your kid flushes it down the toilet and it magically seems to work. Why? Because you put a case around it. You have houses or cars or jewelry that you insure, you protect against them. You keep your money in a bank or maybe you dig a hole in your backyard or you keep it safe. You guard it, you protect it. If you're a dad of a teenage daughter who is dating, you answer the door with a shotgun in hand. <laughs> and every dad of a teenage daughter said, amen, amen to that. That's a, you, you guard it and, and you protect things that matter and your spiritual life is of high value and of high worth and we should guard and protect it. And the apostle Paul, he writes, pins a letter to a Christians or a church in, in Ephesus and, and talking about this idea of guarding and protecting and he gives this great metaphor, this great analogy that if you've grown up in church or in Sunday school, you've most certainly heard and it's called the armor of God. And and if you're here and you've never grown up in church, the Apostle Paul is writing to this group of Christians and he gives them this really great metaphor analogy to begin to pray through as they find themselves in spiritual attacks. And then Paul is writing this and he's actually a prisoner in Rome and he's writing this letter and, and many people would think that there was a high possibility that he would be chained to a Roman guard or Roman officer as he's writing this. And Paul begins to describe uh, what a Roman officer would wear and then relates it to our own spiritual life and our own spiritual battle. With that in mind, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. They will certainly put it up on the screen. 
Ephesians chapter six, and we're gonna start in verse 10. And Paul is finishing up this, this letter. And the first half he's written is a very theological, kind of a, a heady written letter. And then the last part of the letter is a very practical letter. And here's what it looks like in your life. And then he finishes it up with this armor of God and just talks about the spiritual battle that all of us as followers of Jesus face on a daily basis. Look at Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. He says this, a final word, or is this his final conclusion? Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. And what he's saying is put on all of God's armor. Or in other words, the armor of God is not multiple choice. It's not, man, I think I'll put on the helmet of salvation today and maybe the sword of the spirit tomorrow. It's all the armor the whole time from head to toe, all of God's armor. It's not a multiple choice test. Continues on. Verse 12. He says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And what he's saying is the armor of God is meant for combat, not for appearance. He goes, when you pray on the armor of God, it's not meant for showmanship. It's not meant for pomp and circumstance. It's meant to go to battle. It's meant to go to war. It's meant to be in combat. It's not meant to be pretty. It's not meant to be shiny. It's meant to be used. Look what he continues writing, verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. What he's saying is armor up before you go to war. It's not multiple choice. It's not put on a piece here or a piece there. He goes, it is meant for battle it is meant for combat. It is meant for war. It is not showmanship, not pomp and circumstance. Therefore, before you go to battle, before you go to war, armor up. And here's the armor of God. Verse 14. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes. Put on the, shoe, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And again, if you've grown up in church, maybe you're like me, you've studied this. I remember in Sunday school, Sunday school teachers would put this up on a flannel board or maybe they'd bring little armor pieces and I've studied it before, but not until this week did it really dawn on me why the Apostle Paul, why he lists the armor out in this way. I've read this before and, and it never really made sense why he talks about the belt and then kind of goes randomly, in my opinion, because I look at it and go, why didn't he just go head to toe? Why didn't he just look at a Roman officer and just go, well, this is the helmet all the way down to the shoes. The reason why is he lists the armor in the order that a Roman soldier would put it on. He lists the armor in order that way that a Roman soldier would put on. So the first thing they would put on would be the belt of truth. It is the central thing that would hold everything together. The, the, the sword and the, the body armor, the breastplate of righteousness. So it was the belt of truth. And then it was the body armor or the breastplate of righteousness which would be connected next. Then once they get that on, they would then put on the shoes of peace. And then he would pick up the shield of faith. Remember, he still have one hand left. He would take his helmet, put his helmet on, and then grab his sword, and he was ready for battle. And the Roman soldiers would know their gear, what it could do and what it couldn't do, what its strengths were, what its limitations were. And we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, should know the armor of God inside and out. We should know what the helmet of salvation is and the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit and the body armor of righteousness, the belt of truth and the feet of the peace of goodness. We should know those inside and out. 
when we went and visited Monday with the police officers and, 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 and firemen, when we, when we visited with them, they all had their own gear. Firefighters, they had the fire pants and the jacket and the helmet and the oxygen tank and the crowbar and the police officers had their body armor and the belt and pistols and everything. And when we visited with both of them, both firemen and police officers knew their gear with precision. Knew it with precision. They knew exactly how many minutes of oxygen were in their tank. They knew exactly how many pounds of pressure would come from a fire hose. When you talk to police officers, they knew exactly how fast a bullet would come out of their pistol versus how fast it would come out of their rifle. They knew exactly how heavy their armor gear would be. By the way, a SWAT gear, their armor weighs 70 pounds. Let me say that again. Their armor weighs 70 pounds. And the test for SWAT is they have to run in a mile in a 70 pound armor. They knew exactly with precision what their gear could and couldn't do, the limits of their gear. How crazy would it be if we went and asked them, we went and asked an officer, well, what kind of firearm do you carry? Beats me, you know, whatever they gave me. I don't know. <laughs> go to firefighter. Hey, how much oxygen do you have in your tank? Poof, man, I don't know. We just go in there and if we can't breathe, we assume we're out of oxygen. They knew exactly with precision down to the minutes, 15 minutes. But if we're, we're, we're moving a lot of things, it gets less and we've got to dial on there. They knew with precision as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we should know with precision what the armor of God is and know that it's not multiple choice. It's not one day, man, today, God, I just need some faith. God, just give me some faith and all the other stuff I'll deal with tomorrow. God, today, I just need to know truth. God, give me the belt of truth. And I just want, just truth is all I need today. It's all armor before you walk into spiritual battle. Firefighters and police officers, they don't just throw on a hat and go, I'm going to fight a fire. They don't just throw on a t-shirt and go, I'm going out here. They put on the full armor. They armor up before they go to battle, before they go to combat. What the apostle Paul is saying is going, listen, you're fighting a real battle. And no, it's not flesh and blood. And no, it's not eyeball to eyeball. It's, it's a spiritual battle. And it's as real as real can be. And don't go to battle and don't go out there without fully armoring up before you go to war. I want to just walk back through these pieces and just give you a few things to pray. Verse 14. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. First thing, God, let me know the truth. God, let me know about the truth about my life. Morals, values, God, the truth about my family. God, just speak the truth to me. God, give me the truth about my identity, where I find my self-worth. God, I just want, to speak, want you to speak the truth to my heart and to my mind. It says, and the body armor of God's righteousness. God, guard my heart with your righteousness. God, I want to walk before you. God, I want to do the things that you call me to do. God, give me a heart of righteousness. And look what it says. Verse 15, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. For shoes, it's the peace, the gospel of peace. Now, here's what's interesting. Roman soldiers would have a distinct advantage because of their shoes. You see, their sandals would have studs on the bottom, or it's a version of what our cleats. And so they would dig in and be ready and stand prepared and would not be pushed back because of the leather on the bottom. They would have studs or cleats on the bottom. And the shoes had to be, had to be fit and well-worn because as they marched. Now, how many of you ladies in the room, now I, asked, I gave men a hard time last week, but how many of you ladies in the room, you have worn a pair of shoes that nearly killed your feet, but they looked really, really good? Just by a show of hands? Okay, okay. You're, at the end of the day, your feet are just swollen. They can, you can't do anything and your feet hurt. I mean, you know this. I mean, shoes, they must bring peace. And, <laughs> and what Paul is saying is going, the gospel, the good news, that's your foundation of peace. You know, the good news that Jesus went to the cross for you and for me and died for our sins and was buried and God raised him from the dead on the third day and that when we place our faith in him, our, our sins, past, present, and future forgiven and when we die, we're gonna spend eternity in heaven. That should go, whew, peace. 
And I know I'm going into battle. And I know it's combative. And I know there's going to be some difficult conversations. And I've got anxious thoughts. So I'm going into an environment where there's temptations. But God, give me the shoes of the peace of the gospel of Jesus. Continues on. Verse 16. In addition to all of those, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Interesting thing about this shield, the Roman shield, was about two feet wide by about four feet tall. Big, large shield that they carried. And what was interesting is when they marched into battle, when they could bend down, these shields could interlock with shields next to them. And so when people would stand next to each other, it would form this wall. The the Christian life, the battle is not an isolation thing to be fought. It's a team battle. It's to be locked arms together with other believers and go lean into me and I'll lean into you. God, give me the shield of faith. God, bring other brothers or sisters of faith into my life that we can lock arms and we can fight this battle together. God, give me the shield of faith. Verse 17, it says, and put on salvation as your helmet. God, guard my eyes and my ears and my mind and all my thoughts. God, give me the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the sword that they would carry would be a short dagger, would be for close hand-to-hand combat. It was a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And Paul lays out this beautiful word picture of what it looks like to walk into a spiritual battle. So whether you're a first responder or you're a mom or a dad or a student, you're married, you're single, you're going into some type of spiritual battle. You're going into a boardroom meeting, a difficult conversation, a locker room, a classroom. For some of you, you're going into your in-law's house this afternoon for Sunday lunch. (laughs) And you know, and going, God, I'm going to... I'm going to experience things, there's going to be conversations, my mind's going to be racing. God, give me the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith and the body armor of righteousness, the belt of truth and the shoes of peace of the good news. God, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be tough, but God, I'm going to armor up before I go in. Take on the full armor of God. It's not a piece by piece. It's not a multiple choice. How crazy would it be if we walked into battle with just a sword or with just a shield or with just a helmet? Paul goes, it's all armor the whole time. This past winter here in Georgia was our very first winter in, uh, in Georgia. And I can just tell you this, that compared to Texas, it was freezing around here. And by freezing, I mean it got below 60 degrees for a week. Now, if you're a northerner, you make fun. I get that, but it's just, so I came over. It was very, very cold, and one of the first cold snaps that hit, I was taking my daughter, Kara, uh, to, to preschool, and we walked out, and she kind of got in the back and buckled herself in her car seat. I wasn't paying much attention. I looked back, and I saw the way uh, my wife, Brianna, had dressed her, and the way she had dressed her, uh, she, there was no way that Kara was going to be cold by any means. And so she didn't just put on earmuffs. She didn't just put on gloves. Let me show you exactly how she dressed Kara. Uh, This is Kara sitting in my car seat there in the back. (laughs) (laughs) Completely covered, right? She got eyes and her nose exposed and that's it. And so She's probably sweating profusely in that car, but when she stepped out in that 60 degree weather, she was warm. (laughs) Armor up. Don't go to battle without the the proper gear. Firefighters, police officers, EMS, first responders, don't walk into a situation without the proper gear. Paul is saying, don't walk into spiritual battle without the full armor of God. I want to finish up with what he says in Verse 18, he says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Again, he goes, it's it's not an isolation thing. It's not a gosh, go to war and hope you survive. It's a team thing and you lock arms and you pray for one another and going, I'm about to walk into some serious spiritual battles. Will you pray for me? I will pray for you. I will lift you. Will you you lock arms with me as I walk into this situation? Verse 19. 
Paul says, and pray for me too. And ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly pro- explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. Or in other words, the good news is for everyone. He goes, I am in chains now, I'm still a prisoner, still preaching this message as God's ambassadors. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. He goes, pray for me, pray for each other. It is a real war. It is real battle. There's a spiritual battle out there. Don't go into it unarmed. Don't go into it without the armor of God. Pray, say, God, I'm going to just pray through it. I don't remember the guy on stage. I'm not even sure I'm going to get all the pieces right, but God, you know my heart, and I'm just going to work through it. God, I'm about to walk into a very difficult situation. God, give me the armor of God. I'll just tell you personally, I I walk through this prayer pretty much on a weekly basis, but most certainly every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning. I wake up early uh, before anyone, drank my coffee, sit there in bed, just think about Sunday, begin to get ready for it. And I realize that when you walk in here, it's, it's spiritual battle, it's spiritual warfare. We're gathering together to lift up the name of Jesus. There's a spiritual battle at war. And so before I get dressed and, and walk out the door and preach, my, my goal is going, God, give me the armor of God. And I pray through it. I don't remember the way Paul says it, so I just go head to toe, I think logically that way. And I just go, God, give me the helmet of salvation. God, guard my eyes and my ears and my mind. God, give me the shield of faith. God, let me just believe that you're gonna do whatever it is that you wanna do. God, give me the sword of the spirit. Let me rightly divide your word. Let me teach your word correctly and the truth. And God, let it just be sharper than a two-edged sword. God, give me the body armor of righteousness. God, guard my heart. Guard my heart. Let me walk in your righteousness. God, give me the belt of truth. Let me listen to what you have to say and what nobody else has to say. Let me listen to your word and your truth. God, give me the shoes of peace. God, let me boldly proclaim the gospel in a way that brings peace. Visiting with both the firefighters and police officers, I asked them, as firefighters, I said, what's it like running into a burning building? And I asked one of the SWAT guys, I said, what's it like breaching a door not knowing what's on the other side? And they both got real quiet and they just said, everything slows down. Your senses get heightened. Your sight and your hearing, you just, you see and you hear things and everything slows down. And he just walked, talked about when you walk into that fire and you can't see anything and it's smoke. And he talked about when you breach that door, not knowing what's on the other side and just said, everything slows down. But then both firefighter and the police officer that I visited with, both of them said, but our team is there. The unit that we work with is there. Firefighters said, we walk in, it's hot, it's smoky, you got the oxygen mask on, but we know that our firefighters are there and there are alarms and they've got our back and we've got their back and we walk in, we handle the situation. SWAT officer that I visited with, he was the one that breached the door with the shield and the pistol. He said, I was the first one through the door. He said, but I knew that my teammate had his rifle pointed over here. I had his back and he had my back. And if you're a first responder here in this room, what I want you to know and what you want you to understand is this, is that here at Mountain Lake Church, we have your back and we are your biggest fans. And I know that you see and you deal with the unthinkable. I visit with many, many officers and firefighters and just the things that they have to see and process on a weekly basis, nobody should have to go through. But you do it for our communities and our neighborhood and our counties. And so you need to know that Mountain Lake Church, we have your back and we are your biggest fans. But what I hope you understand greater than that is what's behind Mountain Lake Church. And it's the spirit of God. And as followers of Jesus, we know that what you walk into may be scary. If you're a mom or a dad or a student, you're walking to a spiritual battle that's scary. But as followers of Jesus, the God of the universe has your back. Romans 8, 31 and 32 said, if God is for us, who could ever be against us? 
For he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us. Won't he most certainly give us everything else? The God of the universe knows you, cares for you, loves you, sent his son to die on the cross for you. He most certainly has your back. My hope and my prayer is that whatever you walk into as a first responder or just a person walking into a spiritual battle, when you walk in, you pray on the armor of God and say, God, it's going to be painful, it's going to be difficult, but go before me. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I lift up every, every first responder here in this room and their family members. Lord, I know that they see and deal with things on a daily basis that really no one should have to, but they do, and they do it out of service and love for the communities that they're in. And if you're a first responder or you're a mom or a dad, or you're, you're here, you're a follower of Jesus, I would just encourage you just right now to begin to pray through the armor of God. Maybe you haven't done that or haven't done that in a while and just say, God, I don't know what I'm going to walk into this afternoon at that lunch, what I'm going to walk into at school this week or at work this week, but God, give me the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the body armor of righteousness, the belt of truth, and my feet shod with the peace of the good news. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't know what your story of faith is. I don't know if you're here just for the first time or you're checking things out or a friend invited you. But you may have never made Jesus Lord of your life. And I can tell you that when you do that, you will experience a peace and a hope that you have never experienced before. And you can walk out of this room knowing that regardless of whatever situation you find yourself walking into, that the God of the universe is for you and cares for you. If you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer of salvation right now. And the Bible says this, it says, all who call upon the Lord will be saved. And there's nothing super spiritual about this prayer. It's just a confession of your heart. And I don't care if this is your first time ever in church, you've never read a single sentence in the Bible, but you go, I'm ready to experience the love of my heavenly Father. I'm ready to experience a peace and a hope. Say this prayer, place your faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross. Today you will be saved. Just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Without you, I cannot get into heaven. So come into my heart. Be Lord of my life from this day forward. Thank you for my salvation. 